Sean, firstly, what's been on your mind this week? Football. <laughs> Boys. Apart from, Boys is apart from Archie Mafeje and Cedric Robinson, like looking at their writings, um, see what people have said about them. I would say just football, African football. So mm -hmm. I know for a lot of you, it was the so-called international break. You weren't looking at football because your club wasn't playing. <laughs> you basically, your grief would say you're you're not the colonial club in the lucrative um, European leagues. And so uh, what happened was um, uh, players traveled, if you want, home to go play for the national team. Um, I know that South America had a break, but most other national teams were playing. Um, and so the main one was people, I know a lot of people are watching the European nations playing for their qualifying matches for the World Cup. But what was more interesting for me was um, I was paying attention to the qualifiers for the for the African Cup of Nations. Uh, and that's a tournament that's played every two years. It was supposed to happen this year, but um, it got canceled uh, because of COVID. And so now it's going to take place next year in January in Cameroon. And so this past week was kind of the crunch week, like when there was like one, there's like one match, two matches left. You could now see who was going to qualify. So 19 teams qualified for this 24 spots. I'm not going to go through all the qualifiers and some of the usual suspects, of course, they did qualify. But there were some really nice ones that came through that I, I will recognize here because I think people don't say that enough. Uh, Malawi qualified. I was quite pleased to see that. I think they beat Uganda maybe if it was for, in a game. So did the Comoros. The Comoros Islands qualified. Mm -hmm. This was their first time. They've only participated in international football since 2006. Gambia qualified like sort of like next to next to Senegal and Senegal's of course Senegal qualified. Um, and so uh, the last one was Sudan. There's like I think there's like the other five places are still left, but Sudan qualified and they were beaten by South Africa. They, sorry, they beat South Africa 2-0 which is kind of where my uh, the last that result of <laughs> setting um, as a South African, um, it's particularly disappointing. And I was just going to say, we're going to get the usual introspection, the long articles from South Africa about we were once great in the mid nineties, look how we've fallen, you know, mm. it, it just, yeah. And the same old, it's going to be the same old discussion, but I think it will be kind of cliche because it won't lead yeah. to anything. And so I, I was talking to my brother, you know, when these things happen, I call up my brother usually after a game. I'm watching South Africa. I struggle to get the signal, be in sports on some streaming device. And I was like, I'm good for the game. And when I was started watching, I was like, yo, it's already 2-0. I was upset. My Sunday was over. So I called my brother. And my brother was like, yo, here's the solution. They need to start playing players who are making their careers in South Africa, making their lives in South Africa, and who ostensibly have become South African. In other words, the idea of who plays for the national team in South Africa should change. And this it's ironic also that South African football and South African football fans will make a lot of noise about xenophobic Europe and xenophobic national teams in Europe who don't want to play, you know, players of African descent. We'll have like articles written about the French national team, the Portuguese national team, and how diverse they've become and how Portuguese people are fighting against that diversity. But when it comes to our own national teams, we fight tooth and nail to keep a particular idea um, of the nation. And so what I, what I, what my brother basically said to me is like, what about, and he, he mentioned that Pizzamo Semani has been going on about this guy, Gaston Serino, who's, who's from Uruguay, actually originally. He was born in Uruguay, but he's literally made his career in South Africa with Mamadou de Sundance. And I think he just got signed by, uh, Pizzo went to al uh, which by the way, I don't know why Pizzo is not the national coach. That's a separate debate. And yeah. oh. Lefi, whoever was is the coach, I've never heard of him. Um, but uh, somebody said no revolution. <laughs> uh, but Justin Serino should be playing for South Africa. And Pizzo actually has been making this case since last year, saying why isn't Safa picking this guy and making him part of the national team? Similarly, there's another player who's eligible to play for South Africa, uh, Samir Nurkovic, who, who plays for Kaiser Chiefs. Brilliant player from Serbia originally. He has actually said he would like to play for South Africa. But for some reason, a football fraternity in South Africa doesn't want to pick the guy. My quick two other points about this is, it's also bizarre why, why football is so weird and backward about this in South Africa, because it's not unusual in South Africa. Football, by the way, have picked, the football's picked some players who are from somewhere else. Uh, they've picked, these are, these are actually highlights of sort of Markovic, 
uh, in, in accent for Kaiser Chiefs. I mean, we need this kind of striker. Currently, we have like yeah. Percy Tao. That's 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 what we got. He's great, but he's not a natural goal scorer. But anyway, they've had like Hans Funk. They picked him quickly before the '98 World Cup. Pierre Issa, who played for Marseille, who's of Lebanese background, no connection to South Africa. They had no problem with having those guys in the team. Why can't they have these players? Um, Similarly, I would say in other sports codes in South Africa, they pick players who are not born in South Africa. In, in rugby, for example, you have uh, Bees um, um, Tawarira, uh, Tawarira, who was from, originally from Zimbabwe, but for all intents and purposes, if you ask South Africans, nobody says that about him anymore. He's, yeah. he's part of that fabric of what we think about as sort of diverse country. So he's playing for South Africa, uh, and he's playing in the rugby team. You have uh, um, Imran Tahir, who is a spin bowler in the cricket team from Pakistan, just came to South Africa. When the cricket team needed a good spinner, they picked him. So I would like to see that in football. I'm talking directly to Safa right now. They're not seeing this program. And I also, <laughs> here's why I always like football. This thing about football that I really like, about women's football. And I don't know if you remember uh, when uh, when um, in Nigeria they, they, they had the protests, um, the, the hashtag protests um, uh, late last year now or earlier yeah. this year. Now the name of the, this is so terrible. In SARS. In SARS. And what was fascinating about this, the first footballer to make a political intervention there plays for the women's team. She plays, I think, for FC Barcelona Feminine. And similarly, it is the women's team in South Africa in football that has actually done this already. This One of the stars of the 2019 World Cup team was a, is a player called Ode Fulutudilu, who was born in the DRC. And... Is essentially a product of uh, is a, a child of refugees. Um, family ended up in Cape Town, and she played. She started a club football in some of the women's clubs in Cape Town. She currently plays in Finland. Before this, I think she played in Spain for Malaga. She played in the national team. So, if the women's team, I've always said it, if the women's team is showing the men's team how to do this, yeah, the men's national team, then yeah, we should. This should be happening in South Africa. And again, the larger point here is really about national identity in South Africa. And about yeah. we are South African, it's 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 this idea that only the people we said this before who's been a party to the conflict, i.e., whether you came there on a boat, whether you enslaved people, whether you were slave, uh, uh, whether you were oppressed, you all have the right to the place. But it it doesn't extend; it hasn't extend further than that. So it's a very bounded idea of the nation. And maybe football, which always shows the way, should turn up right now and do the right thing. So we can start winning again. We can. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm fed up. Well, what was what's on your mind? I think it's going to be more weight. It's going to carry more weight. Not at all. Not at all. What would be so funny is that once the show ends and we, we select the clips to put on our YouTube channel, we should title this uh, a message to the South African Footballing Association from Sean Jacobs <laughs> and, and promote it as that so that it can get to the to the right ears. Um, but yeah, what's what's been on mind is nothing quite as deep, actually. I've, I've been thinking about memes. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about this real quick, but as as people by now know, there's a, a big crisis that's ongoing in the Suez Canal in in Egypt. And I mean, I don't think I need to give the breakdown of what's happened, but there's this massive container ship called the Ever Given that's blocked the southern entrance to the canal, and it's basically just carrying too much cargo. And the canal, when it was designed in 1869 wasn't built for the passage of ships that big and there's an article here on the washington post by lale khalili who explains this 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 big debacle really well but i think what's been quite funny about this episode is that while there was a suez crisis that happened um during the presidency of egyptian president uh Gamal, Gamal Abdel Nasser in I think 1956. Uh, and that was like a super intense crisis. He nationalized the canal and uh, the, U the UK, France and Israel invaded Egypt and there was a conflict. Uh, and then this one, this happens. And what's actually overshadowed the crisis itself have been the memes that have been produced around the crisis. So the meme format that's that's doing the rounds is basically you see this massive looming ship and there's on the banks of the canal there's a small digger that's just basically trying to excavate uh and people are just going wild with this meme this is my favorite one that's on screen now it's just juxtaposing these two Karl Marx quotes and it has 
uh, the one on the on the ever given ship and the men making their own history being this little puny timid digger trying to 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 sort of um, to break the 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 ship uh, free. So I, I just I just thought these memes were absolutely hilarious, and you know there's a lot to say about memes as a as an image format and what their circulation means for the spirit of the age and how you know it has this incredible ability to to communicate complicated points in a very accessible and immediate way, but at the same time it can also make humor but repetitive and routinous. So that's that's for another day, um, but. These are some yeah. These are some really good memes that are that are doing the rounds and and yeah, that's been that's been that's what's been on my mind. <laughs>